A very warm welcome. You're joining us at Hyde Park on Other Derana 24. And I thought of discussing the most recent developments uh, for the island nation internationally. The draft resolution titled Promoting Reconciliation, Accountability and Human Rights in Sri Lanka was adopted uh, by the UNHRC with 22 countries voting in favour of the resolution while 11 countries voted against it and there were abstentions too, especially by neighbouring India as well as Japan. Uh, I thought of discussing uh, Sri Lanka's way forward, how Sri Lanka is going to work with these countries and engage with the international community going forward with none other than the Foreign Secretary, Admiral Jainat Kulambagi. Thank Hello. you very much for being here. Hi, Hi Boan. Hi, Boan. Um, I think uh, right now what's happened has happened, but uh, there are some positives also for Sri Lanka mm -hmm. to look at. But in your view, how do we move ahead as a nation when we deal with these countries with a new resolution adopted against Sri Lanka? Well, you see, I mean, uh, uh, let me start with the Sri Lanka's foreign policy. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, in our history of 73 years after independence, at least we have uh, written down, mm -hmm. cabinet approved, parliament kept informed, written down foreign policy. For so the first time. For the first time. Now, the number one foreign policy is the neutrality. Mm -hmm. Now, we, I think the president uh, really studied through the whole thing and he said, Sri Lanka, while technically being a non-aligned country, wishes to remain a neutral country. Mm. Now, in the very, what if some powerful countries don't want us to be neutral, right? Although we would like to be a neutral country, some powerful countries, especially mm -hmm. in the Indian Ocean, would feel, no, you should ban wagon with us mm -hmm. against another power. I think this is the crux of the matter. This is where the things have started, right? Now, you mentioned about the Human Rights Council, okay. and I would say this is nothing to do with human rights. This resolution is not, not anything about human yeah, rights. What is it about? It is all about politics. Mm -hmm. It's all about international politics. And especially, this resolution is only have a very brief mention about the conflict which we uh, ended 12 years ago. It talks about this year. It talks about dangerous trends. It talks about a, a negative trend, right? It talks about internal domestic politics. So that is why I say this is not about human rights, mm -hmm. right? Human rights are weaponized, heavily politicized in this world by powerful countries. When they want a small, less powerful country to toe the line, so to say, and to kneel down, then they use human rights. Now look at the vote. You mentioned 22 voted. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is very uh, funny situation in the Human Rights Council. Imagine a situation, country A is proposing a resolution and only he get two votes. And against that, maybe one vote, the resolution is adopted. Mm -hmm. Even with the one more, th more than the other side, I, I'm, I just gave you an arbitrary example, two to one, the resolution is adopted. Is that a correct way to look at it? You know, in a parliamentary democracy, we always believe in 50%. I mean, that is a majority, like 51% or 50.1% is a simple majority, but not in the Human Rights Council. Mm -hmm. they That's their standard uh, This approach. is what is happening. Mm -hmm. So, when you look at it, yes, they got 22, mm -hmm. but against that, there were 11 countries who voted against and 14 countries abstained from voting. So when we look at it, you know, all these 47 countries could have voted for the resolution, mm -hmm. but some countries decided to oppose it. Some countries decided to remain neutral. Now that means the whole lot was not with the resolution. So we have to look at uh, this in that way. And also in the very, look at the 22 countries which actually uh, propose and suppose and endorse this resolution. Except for one or two countries which are not highly developed countries which are depending on the AIDS, all are European countries. Western Europe and Eastern Europe. You know, in this council, there are Western, we call them blocks. We have Western block, we have Eastern block. 
except Russia, all the other countries voted against Sri Lanka. And then from outside that, of course, America and Canada and England. And then totally outside was Malawi mm -hmm. and uh, Marshall Islands and also uh, South Korea from East, right? When you look at Asia Pacific, majority of countries voted against the resolution. Mm -hmm. Now we live in Asia Pacific, right? So at least in our neighborhood, we have not lost this. We got more votes than other side. And also in the very, look at these countries. What are the common denominators for these countries? Whites, mm -hmm. right? So I see it is some kind of apartheid here. And former colonial masters accused of large-scale killing, large-scale human right violations, scorched earth policy, making people starve, right? Burn their crop, slavery, right? These are some common denominators of most of these countries, right? So this is not even the pot calling the kettle black because we are not even black, right? So this is a dichotomy. This is a hypocrisy. This is a very unfortunate situation. Now I think we are very grateful because, uh, I mean, if you have followed the voices, spoke on behalf of Sri Lanka against this resolution, there were very, very powerful voices raised in that council. Right. Uh, I think China's stance was that um, while expressing its opposition, China said that politicization of human rights and what he termed the representative, permanent representative, called it a double standards being displayed. So thereon, there were, there were uh, utterances made by countries who were supporting Sri mm -hmm. Lanka in uh, its efforts. But I'd like to go to Michelle Bachelet, who uh, you did mention that most of the recommendations and uh, uh, the report was based on what had happened in the year past. Yeah. Um, while COVID-19, Sri Lanka's measures uh, taken within the country and also some minority concerns pertaining to burial were also uh, mm -hmm. mentioned here. Michelle Bachelet says that domestic initiatives have failed to ensure justice within Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. How does Sri Lanka look to engage with the UN? Because we cannot isolate the nation either. But this has been a concern from the UNHRC, uh, whichever country that brought resolution after resolution mm -hmm. against Sri Lanka. But in order to ensure no, that Sri Lanka's You are absolutely case, right, Indivari. There is no way we want to get isolated mm -hmm. in the world. We are a responsible country, a sovereign nation, and we are one of the 193, and we will remain that, and we will continue to engage with the international community, especially the United Nation. Now you ask, uh, because this accusation that the domestic mechanisms of this country has not worked, now, Indivari, let me point to you, the World War II was fought in till about 1945. We still see the wounds are still there, unhealed, right? We still uh, hear about, you know, the, the uh, you know, comfort woman and compensation. We still hear, right? And the island issue uh, uh, sorted some time back, but still we do hear some misunderstanding. So the, uh, my argument is a long drawn conflict, intractable conflict, which was fought for nearly three decades. Now three decades is at least two generations, right? It need time to resolve. It need time to heal, right? It will take at least another one and a half generation to heal that completely, right? Now let's look back from 2009 to 2015, what happened? You know, three commissions were appointed. Mm -hmm. Parnagama Commission, Lessons Learned Reconciliation Commission, Udulagama Commission. 92% of land released back to the people. 295,000 Tamil people who were used as a human shield by the LTT, taken, cared for, treated, and resettled. Right. 12,500 ex-LTTE combatants, they were not sent through the judiciary process. They were taken to rehabilitation and they were reintegrated to the society. The child soldiers, large number of child soldiers who were fighting for the LTTE were not even treated as combatants. They were treated as victims of war and they were sent back to school 
giving books, shoes, school bags, and there is one uh, such small boy has become a doctor now, right? So this is what Sri Lanka did. So 2009 to 2015, we were harping on a domestic mechanism to address the residual issues of the conflict, right? But unfortunately, thereafter, we did not uh, pursue those avenues mm -hmm. and instead we went to the uh, Human Rights Council and we wanted to work with them. Uh, I'm not criticizing that move or whatever uh, happened. Co-sponsorship. Co-sponsorship. We did co-sponsorship mm -hmm. and then of course the government which co-sponsored were there for next four and a half years. They did quite a few things but they could not achieve everything they promised to the international community. Mm -hmm. Right? Why so? because there was no consensus between the executive, the, the, the legislator, and the judiciary. There was no consensus. That is why they could not carry on with their promises. But then what happened? You know, the government which co-sponsored lost popularity, mm -hmm. right? Like a diving bomber, right? 2015, they won. 2018, they lost the local government election. 2019, they lost the presidential election. 2020, completely wiped out. So this is the reality, mm. right? This is the reality. And unfortunately, the current government, I think many, many powerful countries don't like to see this government in power. I think... <laughs> I think on that note, uh, we'll have to take a short commercial break and return to speak more. Welcome back. You're joining us at Hyde Park and we're in conversation with the Foreign Secretary, Admiral Jayanath Kolumbage. Um, Admiral, I think you were talking about uh, uh, certain sentiments in the international community that uh, they're opposed to the present regime in Sri Lanka. Uh, but, but then again, when we talk about, uh, you, you did mention about residual issues of the conflict that needs to be addressed mm -hmm. within Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka also had shown a lot of interest and concern uh, to address domestic issues within the country. But with the uh, recommendations made by this resolution to set up office here, mm -hmm. uh, how are we going to manage this? What, what will Sri Lanka's uh, response or uh, how, how will Sri Lanka address uh, these recommendations? Yeah, Indivari, you mentioned that uh, Sri Lanka need to address these uh, residual issues. We agree. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the 2015 co-sponsorship of the resolution uh, mandated us to create certain offices like the Office of Missing Person, Office of Reparation. Uh, all those things are continuing and they are being empowered. New budgets are located, mm -hmm. new positions are made, action plans are now called for with a view to find tangible time-based answers. Mm -hmm. So those pledges that this government or the previous government made are continuing unabated. Mm -hmm. That is one positive thing because we have given a pledge to the international community as a country. So we are carrying on that. Then also uh, the president appointed a commission of inquiry headed by a Supreme Court judge where there is ethnicity balance in the commission I am saying, right. gender balance mm -hmm. to inquire into all the previous commission reports United Nations Human Rights Council reports, right, and to give a measurable, tangible recommendation within six months. So that is a completely a domestic mechanism according to the laws of this country. Now that is the way we should move on. We should find answers to these residual burning issues and put them behind us and to move on. Right, but then of course the, the, the Human Rights Council, now they have agreed or they have proposed to set up a mechanism to collect, collate and mm -hmm. analyze evidence. Mm -hmm. Now in the very, who, against whom, against what, which period is not mentioned. Mm -hmm. Is it starting from 1815 when the British came and uh, you know did all what they did? These are all recorded. Right? Is it starting from the, uh, the 1971 JVP time? Is it only limited to the LTTE time? Is it not talking about the LTTE atrocities? Is it talking about the second, uh, the in southern ins insurrection in 88-89? Mm -hmm. Is it talking about the Indian peacekeeping force 
while they were here nobody knows right so this is a very broad based approach mm -hmm. right now we don't know how to react to this honestly right so we we need to really discuss mm -hmm. identify technical issues legal issues and come out with a solution and find a way forward but this mechanism is very dangerous why i say that because this is now today it is sri lanka tomorrow it could be another country that this powerful group doesn't like this powerful group doesn't like a particular country they can use this as a mechanism on the contrary in the very look at sri lanka in the world stage right. look at sri lanka in the regional stage is not sri lanka a very peaceful country at this moment i would say this is the most peaceful country in this whole region if you take the indian ocean region we have no issues of course there are certain crimes taking place as in any other society but then major issues are not there but there have also been questions about uh, countries other than the uk that have uh, brought uh, sponsored this resolution about the human rights records too uh, has the sri lankan government raised this thoroughly with these countries concerned we did in fact you know one country uh, is not really correct for me to mention the country's name but in this case i will have to mm -hmm. is malawi mm. now the un human rights commissioner issued a country report or a world report in that she talks about malawi saying 300% increase in crime during the last year right killing of aged women mm -hmm. right killing of children for organ trade right you know mob attacks increased by 300% during the last year and then finally she says the police should take more action to maintain human rights in that particular country mm -hmm. now this particular country is i think it's a very resource rich country but unfortunately for whatever the reason is not a highly developed country so they do depend on aid from uh, certain western countries now this country is co-sponsoring the resolution against sri lanka so this is double standards this is beautiful hypocrisy right but i think for these countries too they had their their politically they're dependent on the support yeah. and aid that you uh, spoke about but the the, the uk uh, and also other strong countries while also we look look uh, uh, in our region uh, if you look at india and japan uh, india and japan abstained from voting mm -hmm. uh, at the uh, unhrc sessions but how will you engage how will sri lanka work with india and japan because uh, sri lanka believes this is also a victory for the nation that uh, two of our closest um, allies have not voted in favor of a resolution um, but in dealing with the, these concerns mm -hmm. at the unhrc how will sri lanka uh, work with them to achieve their support going forward you know in the very i mean if you look at the voting in this human right council mm -hmm. it is not based on logic it is not based on argument it is not based on facts it is not based on even principles mm -hmm. it is purely based on the blocks right i would argue with anyone it has nothing to do with natural justice mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with what is presented what is discussed in the human right council if what is discussed in the human rights council is accepted and accommodated right this resolution would have been thrown away mm. right but no you know when the human rights commissioner's report was tabled in the beginning 21 like minded countries spoke on behalf of sri lanka against the report did it matter no nothing it didn't matter at all 21 countries when the draft of the resolution was tabled again a large number of countries spoke against the resolution did it matter no when the final resolution was tabled again eight countries mm -hmm. spoke vehemently against the resolution did it matter no so this is why i say this is not based on logic this is not based on facts this is not based even on what is presented at the commission all these are superficial all these are cosmetics right the vote is decided by certain powerful countries bandwagoning creating blocks against 
another country, mm -hmm. right? So today it is Sri Lanka, tomorrow it could be another country. But then you ask a question about India mm -hmm. and Japan. Now Japan, let me first talk about Japan. Now Japan is having a lot of connections with the Western powers because their security is interlinked to that of American right. uh, military. So they are in a very difficult position. When America says you have to do this, uh, the, you know, they have to listen to it. But we are very happy Japan decided to abstain. I'm sure Japan remembered what, how Sri Lanka stood for Japan in the San Francisco summit. Maybe I don't know. But Japan decided to abstain despite immense pressure applied by these powerful nations to vote against Sri Lanka, vote for the resolution. So that is, I think, something we should really appreciate about. Then you ask about India, it's much more complicated than that. Yes, we wish that India would be supporting Sri Lanka full, fully, but then India has its own issues, India has its own compulsions, India has its own uh, linkages. Right? So even despite that, India did not vote for the resolution. So that is a victory for Sri Lanka. In other words, India did not abandon Sri Lanka. India did not abandon Sri Lanka and took the side of a group of Western countries. Now I would like to recall one message uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi said. Mm -hmm. He said, it, actually I was misquoted for saying that he said, we, we, India will never do injustice to Sri Lanka. It didn't mean that India will vote for Sri Lanka. It meant that they would not do any injustice. I think that's exactly what India did. So now we need to move on. We need to appreciate those who voted against the resolution. We need to work, we need to appreciate those who abstain from the resolution. And look at the African continent. Mm -hmm. Now African continent has large number of votes, but large number of them abstain despite immense pressure coming from the Western countries. What next for Sri Lanka? How will Sri Lanka work about this? We'll talk about that when we return after this short break. Do stay with us at Hyde Park. Welcome back. We're in conversation with Sri Lanka's Foreign Secretary, um, Admiral Kolumbage, you were talking about African nations, nations mm -hmm. of the African continent, despite pressure, uh, mm -hmm. how they voted, how, how, how they uh, behaved and acted uh, at the UNHRC sessions and also Asian nations. But what next for Sri Lanka? What are we going to do going forward? Uh, you did mention that Sri Lanka will honor uh, the international community, continue to work with the international community at the beginning of this conversation. But what next? What are we going to do? Are we going to take any measures within the country? Uh, especially because we have to deal with uh, the international community at a time when a resolution has been passed. Well, in the very, I mean, allow me to say one more thing before mm -hmm. I answer this sure. question. I was referring to India. Mm -hmm. Every journalist who interviewed me, had a chat with me, asked about India. So I couldn't say nothing and wait. I had to say something. But certain things I said that, you know, I said that India said they will never do injustice to Sri Lanka. And you said but you this was misinterpreted, mm -hmm. saying that I said India will vote for us. I never said that. Mm -hmm. So I really want to put the records right. right. Now you ask about uh, how do we move forward. I mm -hmm. think that's the critical question. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, it's only two days after the, uh, the resolution. Right now we are strategizing our next moves. I mean, we need to really uh, 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 sit down and see where the things are. And then, of course, we need to brief our political leadership and get some policy directives from the political leadership as to the way forward. You see, in the very one thing I have to tell you very clearly, I think no other country is interested uh, than Sri Lanka in maintaining peace, stability, and social harmony in the country. No one else. It is in our interest, mm -hmm. you know, if Sri Lanka wants to need to overcome these economic issues that we have, the, 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 the COVID pandemic we have, the only way is for us to be united mm -hmm. as one country, one people. So Sri Lanka is very interested in maintaining this current status quo where the communities are living in peace and harmony. We don't have issues. We want to really keep this balance, right? So we are very interested. But then 
now we need now is the time we need to reevaluate the doables mm -hmm. what are the things that we need to do what are the things that we have done well what are the things we have done halfway through what are the things that we need to do probably within the next year yeah. right because we know that there is a next uh, uh, next uh, council meeting will take place in september mm -hmm. so we need to do the things with a time frame with a tangible results oriented approach we need to identify what are the things that we should do how best we should achieve result and that would nullify majority of this criticism mm -hmm. but in the very i had to tell you they will change the goal post right immediately we address all these residual issues that are burning or that are still uh, you know in our country then there will be something else mm -hmm. right but never mind so but we that would be an unfortunate situation for a small <coughs> island nation as sri lanka well i i began uh, how the U, uh, hu, uh, human rights commissioner's report talk about this year you know we battled uh, a terrible war for 30 long years and that was with the most ruthless terrorist organization in the world we didn't fight in a vacuum but then we are now accused of this year so this is what i said they changed the goal post we achieve something right even if we achieve 100% reconciliation 100% accountability 100% uh, uh, addressing the missing person there will be something mm -hmm. right uh, so there is concern also, uh, Michelle Bachelet, the UN uh, Human Rights Commissioner, s s uh, says that there are signs that past violations could be repeated within Sri Lanka. So they're looking at trends. Uh, but internally, when we address the question of um, uh, clashes, uh, disputes within certain groups, which could be uh, portrayed as communal violence, or there could be uh, disagreements within the country. But these also should be addressed uh, within law enforcement authorities, mm -hmm. national security measures should be brought in together. So there's a concerted effort that's needed within the country. How are we going to bring all stakeholders together in order to not just address the internal matters uh, developing here, but so that a positive message is sent to the international community? Yeah, I mean, uh, you are right because uh, I think this is the first time that we see a resolution is moved for future action because they say things could get worse, violence could increase. So this is, these are all future tense, mm -hmm. not past, not present, but the future. So we have a resolution now uh, talking about the future, right? So whether that is right or wrong, uh, we are debating, we say it is wrong you know, uh, to project saying that, okay, things would get b b bad and therefore, so this could be a, a very vicious thought that things should go wrong in Sri Lanka. Whereas we want things to be right in Sri Lanka, whereas we want uh, uh, for us to be living in peace and harmony as one country, one nation. This is, you know, we don't want any division in this country. But then we, we I mean, I, uh, let me also uh, share with you in the very, there is an allocation of 2.8 million US dollars for this so-called office of mm -hmm. uh, gathering information that uh, the core group has proposed. Now we did a very basic rough calculation right. and we observe entire northern province, people living in the northern province can be given two vaccinations with this money. Entire northern province. Why I say northern province? Because the conflict was mostly initial in the northern province, then it went to the eastern province. So entire northern po population can be vaccinated. Nearly 20,000 new houses can be constructed. And we know in the north we have a drinking water problem. Mm -hmm. A major drinking water project can be undertaken. So please do that rather than you know base, uh, spending some money on a mission which is not even consented conquered by Sri Lanka, right? Make use of that money. And also in the very, I have to tell you, beginning of the session, the Human Rights Commissioner said they have serious financial constraints. Mm -hmm. Serious financial constraints because, you know, their budget has increased. Countries are not contributing the, 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 uh, what was promised. Mm -hmm. So they, they released a report saying they have serious budgetary constraint. But even despite that, a 2.8 million is allocated for this. 
maybe Sri Lanka can appeal to the UNHRC to well we have to see we have to see we have to see whether we can appeal to the UNHRC chairperson or the the president whether we can do something with the UN mm -hmm. the, we are uh, the con contemplating all avenues uh, because we not only we really when I say we Sri Lanka and many other countries feel this is wrong mm -hmm. this country specific unsubstantiated unconquered un, uh, 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 bias resolutions are wrong so we need to keep on the fight otherwise is we will uh, let uh, let down our friends is Sri Lanka uh, does Sri Lanka fear that this office uh, that will gather information will still be biased against Sri Lanka because foreign sec uh, foreign minister Dinesh Gunawardena at the sessions uh, accused the OH, uh, OHCHR of failing to take into consideration <coughs> and publish the Sri Lankan government's own written uh, commitments and authenticity of uh, findings of the Sri Lankan government so is there some sort of well fear? I, I have a very short answer in the very you know, in Sinhala, we have a saying, Nadu Thamuduruange, Badu Thamuduruange, right? Now, if this office is funded by the co-group, and if the people are representing the, the co-group countries, can we expect any justice from this institution that they are talking about, right? Unless it is a UN mechanism, right, where the funding is coming from the United Nations, or all, I mean, when I say UN, it's all countries, right? unless the UN you know decide okay who should be there if the if the mm, officials are among them if the funding is um, from them we can never expect justice to Sri Lanka mm -hmm. so this is it uh, we'll take a short break and return to speak about how the present challenges will shape Sri Lanka's foreign policy and international relations going forward Welcome back. Uh, Foreign Secretary, I think earlier on, uh, you mentioned that uh, Sri Lanka must now look at ways uh, to be able to treat our friends as friends and uh, to recognize their efforts and commitments towards Sri Lanka's development. Mm -hmm. But what does this mean? Are we going to look at an enhancement of our foreign policy? Or uh, will our foreign policy, yes, you did mention for the first time in our history, we have a written down policy, a document mm -hmm. for foreign uh, policy. But will there be enhancement amendments or some changes to enhance the scope of uh, how we work with the international community? Well, in the very, I don't see a major shift in our foreign policy, and it's too early for me to comment even because without consulting the political leadership, you know, I'm only a government official, uh, so I'm only one uh, part of the whole process, basically the implementation part. So the policy has to be decided by the political leadership. I'm sure they will discuss about it. Of course, we have to present facts, but I don't foresee a major uh, foreign policy shift in this. But as you said, uh, we have to treat our friends as friends. I mean, we need to uh, recognize them. We need to value them. We need to appreciate them. Okay. I mean, Sri Lanka is a small country, but we did not feel that we were abandoned in the Human Rights Council. We, we, we had support uh, uh, on principles, mm -hmm. on, on facts, on uh, arguments, on charter. We had a lot of support, so we need to appreciate them. But it doesn't mean that we need a major shift in our foreign policy. But in the very, I think right now we must put this behind because the COVID is still there. Mm -hmm. We need to take care of our people. I, the president and the government is determined to do it. I mean, although some people accuse of our vaccination program, I think it's moving very smoothly and we do see the results now. We do see the results of the incidence of COVID coming down. Mm -hmm. And most of the vulnerable communities, especially in Kalambu and Gampaha district, are now vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So that's the plus point. Now, this is a time where the third wave has started in the world. And many European cities are now again going for close down. So right. that is one challenge we have. How do we maintain the current status quo in this pandemic? That is the number one mm -hmm. challenge we have. So we need because this is a virus the virus does not differentiate between blacks or white or Sinhala Tamil or Muslim it is against the human so we need to have a collective whole of country approach to battle this virus that is point number one 
Now, during this virus, you know, we have economic issues. You know, our tourism industry is almost uh, very at a very low level. So, uh, we could not really progress the way we wanted. The GDP growth could not be achieved the way we wanted. But the signs are very positive. Signs are very positive that we are on the right track. So, right now, what we should do is to achieve the sustainable development goals mm. by 2030. That is a target set by the United Nation mm -hmm. to the whole world. So we are working very hard on it. We have a very uh, capable uh, person as the director, uh, director General of the Sustainable Development Goal Council. Now, very recently, after a very long time, a council was appointed, steering committee was appointed to monitor, mm -hmm. measure what have we achieved in each goal and what are the action plans that we have from now till 2030, right? And then special reference to SDG goal number 16, which talks about human rights, right? right? So we are interested. I think that is the best way forward to look at the sustainable development goals. You know, it, it speak the word sustainable development goals. Now, if we achieve these, may not be 100%, but at least satisfying measure, then we will be okay. So we need to put all these arguments behind, but these arguments are also important. We can't just idle and let anything go by against us. No, we are not that. Right? We can't just sit here and do nothing about it. No, we created a discussion, we garnered support, and we have proven to the whole world the hypocrisy of the, this uh, type of resolution, country-specific resolution. But then that's only one aspect of our future. We need to achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030 as much as we can to develop the population economically, to have peace in the country, to have human rights protected in for each and every citizen and in a sustainable manner, whether it is the ocean, whether it is the land, in a sustainable manner. So I think that's the way forward for Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. Talking about human rights, uh, while uh, Sri Lanka's uh, human rights um, during the final stages of the war are spoken about, are investigated. Uh, at uh, times as these, pandemic situations as these, there are concerns of human rights violations in any community, in any country, I think, that is also widely discussed world mm -hmm. over. But going forward, uh, very last question uh, to you. Uh, we have about three, four minutes here. But um, about investment policy and foreign uh, policy here, that has continued to be a question in Sri Lanka. With India in recent times also, we spoke about uh, the East Terminal and um, with China and the United States too. Uh, what challenges are you facing or are we, are we managing this question well? Um, in the very, we have taken a major shift in our foreign policy. You know, our foreign policy has been uh, mainly catering to international political diplomacy. We have had great ambassadors, mm -hmm. great representatives, you know, talking about the bigger picture, the international political dimension. Now, I mentioned to you in the beginning that we have a written down foreign policy. In fact, it's 20 point. Mm -hmm. It says 20 point foreign policy directives for 2020 and beyond. Out of this 20 uh, foreign policy directive, nine are talking about a new brand of diplomacy that is economic diplomacy. Mm -hmm. So you are spot on. We need to mix our diplomacy and economic diplomacy together. We need to work to bring in investment to the country. We need to work to bring in tourists to the country. We need to work to uh, uh, create more export to the outside world so that we can earn more money. We need to create more uh, uh, better job market for skill labor into many countries. So this economic diplomacy, we are working very hard and the government has even allocated a large amount of money mm -hmm. to embark on this economic diplomacy combining the foreign ministry, Ministry of Trade, Department of Commerce, Board of Investment, Tourist Board, uh, Export Development Board, T-board and many other, the, uh, of course, the state ministry uh, for regional cooperation and our missions. So this is a Herculean task for the foreign ministry because we need to link all these agencies mm -hmm. 
who are now dealing with the economic development from in, in international sense right. and to deliver through our missions set up in various uh, capitals of the world. Very quickly about Sri Lankan missions, I remember during our uh, last conversation at Hyde Park, you spoke about how you're mobilizing uh, our missions abroad uh, to work towards uh, promoting trade and investment to the country. While that happens, how have you mobilized uh, our missions now in the present context to take Sri Lanka's uh, story to the rest of the world through our missions and what is their responsibility? Well, we have been sharing our notes with all our missions to carry the message to the mm -hmm. other side and they have done it extremely well yes there can be improvements in certain missions I do agree you know it cannot be 100% uh, perfect but our missions really rose to the occasion this time they work we I mean in the very let me say fortunately we had one agenda one strategy and one voice coming from the president prime minister parliament cabinet Foreign Minister, our Honourable Foreign Minister and the, the staff and the missions we work as one team with one agenda. I think that is how we could create this uh, argument in the international domain. So we are determined to keep doing the same thing and even more vigorously. Thank you very much, Admiral Kolumbage, for your time here at Hyde Park, a former commander of the Sri Lanka Navy, a Director General for Indo-Sri Lanka Initiatives and Law of the Sea Centres, the Pathfinder uh, Foundation, and uh, he was also appointed Director General of the Institute of National Security Studies of Sri Lanka in 2020. Um, and the list goes on. He is currently the Foreign Secretary of Sri Lanka, Admiral Jayanath Kolumbage. Thank you very much for joining us at Hyde Park.